Hey everyone, welcome back to Spatial Statistics. We're moving on um, from variograms um, and exploratory data analysis to actually fitting some isotropic spatial models. Um, the top side of this slide is, top half of this slide, um, is all review. Um, we're working with a geostatistical outcome, so something that is recorded at n known fixed locations. We're thinking there's a um, perfectly smooth underlying process that we only observe at a finite number of points. And of course, this is kind of key, it will come in to play later. We just observe a single rep of our n-dimensional process. And I am talking about spatial statistics, not spatiotemporal statistics. In spatial temporal statistics, you can observe multiple observations at every location over time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, a single realization um, across n locations. Now, some ideas about building regression models. We're going to assign things that are measured and or measurable to the mean. So if you're modeling uh, some kind of process, and you notice that uh, it's higher in a corner of a map, um, for no good reason, you can go ahead and throw the coordinates in there. If you're modeling something like temperature and you have the, something like elevation measured at the points where you need um, a temperature, you can put elevation into the model because we know as elevation increases, temperature tends to decrease. So we want to put in everything that we have measured into this mean, of course, with we, we, you know, um, we don't want to put too many things because, uh, because of collinearity. So the new bit of material is the latter two, the spatial effects and the random error. Well, random error is not new because we know from any regression model and setting, um, if we have modeled all systematic variability, what is left over is random noise. If we look at our residuals, and what we see is random noise, then we've done a good job. We have uh, accounted for everything systematic and we have left over everything that is random noise. So, spatial effects. I've mentioned these before. I'll, you know, we're gonna look at them in a lot more detail now. This is all the variability that is not attributable to measured covariates. That is not attributable to the mean. If you're modeling temperature and you have elevation in the mean, then the spatial effects are picking up a linear combination of everything that is not elevation that affects temperature. Things like humidity levels, things like uh, prevailing wind direction. Everything that is very difficult to measure, maybe even impossible to measure, are the effect of heat islands from cities. So, big idea, we're gonna be um, separating the variability between kind of things that are easily measured, large-scale variability, and small-scale variability, we will partition between spatial effects, so these are going to be spatially structured and not noise, and what we hope will be random error, something that will be noise. So let's see what this looks like in a little bit more detail. Uh, the guy in the top right is uh, Professor P.J. Diggle, he does a lot of uh, very cool work in spatial stats, um, big proponent of working in, in low resource contexts, uh, works uh, with neglected tropical diseases. Um, and if you think about it, based on what, what I just said, the power of spatial statistics grows, the harder it is to measure things. So if you are in Sub-Saharan Africa, you might not have a good temperature reading in all of your weather stations. So you will have to use the idea of these spatial effects to pick up everything that is not in the mean. Okay, enough uh, of arm waving, let's get to it. So in the top line, we have kind of our typical regression model. Y is our outcome variable, X prime beta is our mean, and by the way, this S is telling us what varies with location. So of course the outcome variable varies with location, but um, this X is just all of our covariates could very well vary with location. Epsilon is our error term. 
from our typical regression model. Now this is what we end up partitioning into something that is random noise. and something that is spatially structured, spatial effects. So to be clear, these omegas right here, they're not noise. That is something that is not a part of the mean, but that still matters in predicting our outcome. Because we know once we account for these, what is left over is just random noise. So just to, as a reminder, this X prime beta um, element, we can write out more simply, but in a, and I will try to use my stylus here, beta zero, hmm, better, I can do better than that. All right. Beta zero, the intercept. Beta one x one plus beta two x two, all the way until we run out of of, of um, covariance. It's just a more concise way of writing out a linear combination of coefficients and measured covariance. Now these could be categorical or quantitative. Um, there could be interactions, there could be quadratic terms, there could be smooth terms, anything you want. We'll go into that mean. The typical OLS regression error is what we're going to partition into a, a spatial effect that we will write as omega and random noise. We just finished through, um, variogram modeling and we saw that variograms could show us how much of the variability is spatial and how much of the variability is non-spatial. The nugget measures non-spatial variability. Partial sill measures spatial variability. So same concept, just in a regression modeling setting. You can think intuitively that if there's actually no spatial correlation in this error, and again, how do, how do you tell? You run a residual variogram analysis. If there is no spatial correlation in this, in this uh, uh, epsilon tilde, then the spatial component will be trivial. So you think all of these omegas are almost zero and we will just retain the same exact model. And for now, we will just be assuming that our spatial effects, our, as I'll call them, uh, latent spatial effects, because they're not measured, everything measured is in the mean, our latent spatial effects are isotropic. We will relax this assumption in the next unit. So these spatially structured effects are going to be assumed to be distributed by our multivariate normal distribution. This is a uh, vectorization, if you will. It's a generalization of a typical normal distribution to multiple dimensions. So you can go from a bivariate normal, right? We have just this classic plot. If you type in bivariate normal distribution, you're going to have this classic plot of two variables and how they are correlated. These are correlation contours. All right, now um, this is a bivariate normal distribution. But we are going to work with an n dimensional multivariate normal distribution, and so we can't really draw it. All right, and I'm just oof, trying to work with my stylus and it is just not working. All right. So MBN stands for multivariate normal. We will assume these spatially structured components have a mean of zero. Now notice this is a cat, uh, bolded zero. So it's a vector of zeros. So it's an n by one vector of zeros. The sigma is an n by n
variance covariance matrix. So it will have variances. I'll just do the top corner of it, maybe. It will have variances on its main diagonal. And it will have covariances on its off diagonal. And of course, it goes on to make an n by n matrix. Now, you will notice that the way I wrote that, variance-covariance matrix, I made sure to write that it is dependent on theta. So our variance-covariance matrix will be dependent on these covariance parameters that we will have to estimate from the data that will measure how um, the correlations, in other words, covariances in the data change as a function of distance. This noise component, we can write it in two ways. We can write it in terms of an n-dimensional multivariate normal, and that is really uh, a waste uh, because this is the nugget times the identity matrix, n by n identity matrix, with it, which is just a matrix of ones on the main diagonal and zeros in the off diagonal. So this is the same thing as saying that the errors are mutually independent It's going to be a struggle today, guys. The stylus knows that it's been a long day, and it is trying to win, and we won't let him or her. Our spatially structured effects are distributed according to multivariate normal. Our random error term uh, is uh, independent and um, distributed according to also a normal distribution with a mean zero and the nugget as the variance. So let's get into a tiny example with three locations. Three locations, right? So I have a three by one vector of um, spatial effects. These are going to be zeros then, right? It's a mean zero multivariate normal. This alpha squared is my partial cell. Remember what the partial cell is from the previous lecture. It's the difference between the total variance and the nugget. Now, I will again uh, tell you that uh, depending on what book you look at, depending on what journal you read, depending on what blog you read, everyone will adopt a different notation for all of these things. Uh, this is the notation that I picked up from our textbooks. This is what we'll be rolling with. But um, it can be frustrating if once you leave me and then you want to do a spatial analysis, you go back to the book and somebody will have sigma squared s in there, or something to indicate that that's a sill. Um, alpha squared is what we'll be using for the partial sill. Tau squared is what we will be using for the nugget effect. That's the non-spatial variant. non-spatial variance. Okay, three locations. What this is, is a correlation matrix that is three by three, n by n. And when we take a correlation matrix and we multiply it by a variance, we get a variance covariance matrix. 
So in a correlation matrix, there are ones on the main, di main diagonal. On the off diagonals are um, correlations between, this is observation one and two. Here will be correlation between one and three. Here we have correlation between two and three. These are random error terms. Again, we have three of them. Again, they're gonna be mean zero. And remember that this was the identity matrix, right? This is the identity matrix. An identity matrix has ones in the main diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. Okay, how many correlations do we need to estimate for these three locations? Well, one, two, three. Three, or n times n minus one over two. Because, our matrix is symmetric. So we don't need to estimate the upper triangular of that. We only need to estimate the lower triangular and our variance, right? So our n was three. So that's three times two, which is six over two. Three correlations that need to be estimated. But remember, I only observe my total number of pieces of information is three. I have you know, Y1 or YS1, YS2, and YS3. And I'm already talking about estimating the partial cell, the nugget, and three correlation terms. That's problematic, right? Remember, I keep saying that we only get to observe one realization from an n-dimensional process. At each location, our only information to estimate the sum of these components. So the sum of these components comes from right there. Right, I can rearrange this and say that, I just subtract the mean from both sides. My only information to estimate this sum comes from my residual, right, that's the residual. That's why when we're looking at a variogram, we want to detrend. Uh, we want to make sure we're looking at the residuals to get a sense of the spatial process that is going on. How do we do it? We have literally two more parameters to estimate than we have pieces of information. And I haven't even talked about the mean here. Let's assume there is no mean. Even with a, without an informative mean, I have five things to estimate, right? Partial sill, nugget, three off diagonal terms and only three pieces of information. How do we do it? We need to impose a structure on the correlation. Impose a structure on the correlation matrix. That way we won't have to estimate all three uh, off diagonal terms separately. Impose a structure on the correlation matrix. The thing is that we have exogenous or outside information to help us. We know the distance between our observations. And so what we're going to do is model the variance covariance matrix as a function of Remember that H is my distance matrix? You guys visualized it in the last activity? So we will take a look at these spatial correlation functions that take an input of distance between locations I and J, and also here is that theta, right? That is um, our covariance parameter. So these spatial correlation functions will take input of location of distance between any two locations and a covariance parameter and output the correlation between any two locations. Alpha squared, again, is the partial cell. Our nugget effect doesn't change. 
but it is no different than what you would write in a regular um, OLS regression. So what these theta parameters will tell us is really how quickly, sometimes I call it the spatial decay parameters because they measure how quickly correlation decays with distance. In 99.99% .99 of cases, and I'll show you the one case where that's not true, as distance between observations increases, the correlation will decrease. It will go to zero. When we're near, the correlation is high. When we're far apart, the correlation is low. You guys saw this when you were making covariogram maps and uh, binned covariograms. So now that we wrote that, I can rewrite my spatially structured component, still in terms of a multivariate normal. Here are my three uh, spatially structured, my spatial effects. Sometimes they're called small scale variation. They're still gonna be mean zero. I don't estimate a mean here. Here is my partial sill. And now look, my H's are known. And the only thing I have to estimate now is one single, parameter. I went from having estimate three separate off diagonal terms to estimating a single parameter using three um, interpoint correlations that we will find as a predetermined function of the distance between our two locations. So that is the only way we can perform spatial statistics. Now, next two slides, we will have two equivalent ways of writing what uh, Diggle at least calls a classic geostatistical model. This first one is called the marginal model. It's called the marginal model because you will notice where are the W's, right? There are no W's, omegas. Where are the omegas? We had omegas here. We had omegas here. We had omegas here. There are the omegas. And now we got to, to this model, where are the omegas? This averages over our spatial effects. Averages over the spatial effects. That doesn't mean that we can't recover the spatial process because here is my typical mean. And here you will notice that the variance covariance matrix is a, is a sum of the nugget times the identity matrix and my correlation function times the partial sum. So I don't need the omegas. My spatial correlation is captured right in there. I just rewrote what I had here by putting this into the mean. That's all. So now, again with three locations. All right, here are my three locations, right? This is my three by one vector. This is a three by three multivariate normal. I can actually visualize that. It's gonna be kind of a football, all right? A three dimensional, a two dimensional multivariate normal goes from a circle to an uh, ellipse. A three dimensional multivariate normal, if there's no correlation, is a perfect sphere. And then once we start to induce a correlation, it becomes kind of a ellipsoid, think like a football. So here are my means that are linear combinations of my usual regression coefficients and my covariance. Now look, each variance, right, each variance 
is a sum of my partial sill and my nugget effect. And I just list it out because uh, the the, in the correlation matrix, these are all ones in a uh, distance matrix, the diagonals are all zeros. The off diagonal terms, right, because it's alpha squared times something, the off diagonal terms are my alpha squared times the correlation function. Remember that in the identity matrix, the off diagonal terms are zero. That's why the, this doesn't contribute to the off diagonals at all. So we have a three by three variance covariance matrix, three by one mean vector here. So by the way, this also means that my X is three by P, P being the number of covariates you have in the model, and my beta is um, one by P or P by one. The way I wrote this, um, it has to be like that. Just making uh, all the matrix algebra work out and match my notation. Okay, let's try and answer these questions that I have. Does the mean of Y depend on location? Yes, it does. Right? It is allowed to change as I change location. Cool. Does the variance of Y depend on location? No, it does not. My variance is on the main diagonal of this matrix, and it is the same thing at each of my three locations. Does the correlation function depend on location? Nah, it's tricky because I said location. And the answer is no, it does not depend on location. It does depend on interpoint distance, not location. Here are two sets of points at different locations that have exactly the same interpoint distances. So we have imposed, if you remember, second order stationarity. By second order stationarity, the answer to this question is no. What does change inside the correlation function is the input that measures the interpoint distance between points one and two, points one and three, and points two and three. So the, the benefits to this approach, or one major benefit to this approach, is we get to model the outcome directly. We model its mean, and then we model the variability around the mean, but is allowed to be spatial. The drawbacks to this approach, we, as you guys will see later on, have to invert oof, a dense, n by n matrix. That's the variance covariance matrix. Dense means that there are um, no hard zeros. There are no pre-imposed zeros. This is my dense n by n variance covariance matrix. I will have to invert it, right? I will have to find sigma inverse, and that takes a long time. An inverse of a dense matrix is on the order of n cubed operations. So inverse requires an order of n cubed operations. In other words, it takes a very long time. Inverting a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix takes a very, very long time. The other drawback, and I guess now you're thinking, wow, we only wrote down one benefit. But that is an immense benefit. You get to just model what you see. You don't have to make any other assumptions. That's pretty cool. The other drawback is not every distribution 
in fact, most distributions. We can let's rewrite it as most distributions. Most distributions don't have don't have a variance covariance matrix. In fact, the normal and the log normal are probably the only two that have a variance covariance matrix. The Poisson distribution doesn't. The exponential distribution doesn't. The gamma distribution doesn't. This ability for us to just write down, it's just, it's just having an issue. It just knows that I've had a long day and it's just messing with me. Look at it go. It's just like a strobe light, a strobe light of doom. Very good. Our ability to model variability around the mean with this variance covariance matrix is limited only to the normal distribution because other distributions don't have that slot in the, in the formula for us to put in a distance matrix. So this marginal approach where we average over omegas is limited to things that are approximately multivariate normal. Sometimes we can take a quantitative variable, we can take a logarithm, make it multivariate normal, but we can't do it all the time. If, remember scallop catches? Probably couldn't do it then. Oh boy. Oh boy. I hope you guys are having a good time because this thing is, oof, it's bugging. It is bugging. All right. Interesting. It's just going to appear in every slide, isn't it? Unbelievable. I'm going to try and get rid of it, but uh, I don't think it's going to do it. Um, I really don't want to restart this because I... Sorry guys, I really don't want to restart this recording, but I also don't want this thing in the middle of my screen. Tell you what, I will have to pause this and pick it back up in another recording. So um, I will pick this back up right here. <laughs>